It's okay to say it, some people are scared by genetics. Just look at this code, all those different colors and angle brackets everywhere. What even is this function here trying to do? This is the kind of thing that absolutely puts developers off of learning strongly typed languages such as TypeScript. And it leads them to stick with something simpler like JavaScript. But if you avoid type systems like this, then you're actually missing out on quite a lot of great advantages to having a flexible and expressive code base. So don't get intimidated. I'm gonna demystify all of this stuff for you today. So it looks a lot more approachable. First though, what are generics? Generics are a feature that allow you to create classes, interfaces, and methods with a placeholder for the type of data that they store or use. So this means that the same class or method can operate on lots of different types of data. So it's a bit like having a box or a container that can hold different types of objects. The container remains the same, but the objects that it can hold can vary. Generics are not a concept that is exclusive to a single programming language. They're found in many modern programming languages, including Java, C Sharp, TypeScript, and plenty of others. Each language implements generics in its own way, but the core concept remains the same, allowing for type safe data structures and methods that can work with multiple types. One common way that generics are used is in the creation of collection classes like lists or dictionaries or queues. So here's an implementation of a queue in TypeScript. You can see the queue has this T parameter after the class declaration here. So this means our queue can act on any object of any type and you specify what type the objects are when you create an instance of that queue. The T is being used in the functions down inside this class. So for example, the NQ function, that takes an argument of that generic type T. Making the queue generic like this enables it to be type safe, ensuring that only specified type of data can be stored in this queue. So that reduces runtime errors. Without generics, you'd either have to accept any in here, and then you lose all of the benefits of TypeScript, or you'd have to implement different versions of this queue for different object types, so like a string queue and an integer queue and stuff like that. Despite these benefits, some developers do find generics intimidating. One of the reasons for this is that generics introduce a level of abstraction that can be complex to understand at first. Abstraction in programming refers to the concept of hiding complex implementation details behind a simpler interface. To understand this better, let's consider an everyday example. Think of a car. You don't need to know the intricate workings of the engine in order to be able to drive the car. You just need to know how to operate the steering wheel, the pedals, and the gears. The complex details are abstracted away. So similarly, generics abstract away the specifics of the types and allow you just to focus on the logic of the code inside your functions. So now let's look at some generics in TypeScript in a bit more detail. Here's a simple example of a generic function in TypeScript. This identity function has a generic type variable of t. It takes an argument of type t and returns a value of type t back. You can call this function with any type you like and it will return a value of that same type. So for instance, calling identity with number in there and then 100 will return a number, while identity with string, hello, will return a string. This example illustrates how generics can provide flexibility while maintaining that type safety that's so important. The function works for any type, but it still enforces that the input and the output are of the same type. So you can put a type in here, but you can't put in one type and get a different type out. So this is still very much better than using any in TypeScript like this. With any, you can also pass in any type to the function, but we lose that check that forces the function to return the same thing back. In fact, we lose all type checking completely, which kind of defeats the point of TypeScript. But generics don't really stop there. Most languages that support generics, like TypeScript, they allow you to do extra stuff with them, such as restrict which types can be used as your generic parameter. In TypeScript, this is done with the extends keyword. To understand the significance of extends in the context of generics, let's consider another example. Imagine you have a function that's supposed to work with objects having a specific structure, such as objects with a particular property like this. Without any constraints, generics would accept any type, which might lead them to runtime errors if they pass the object that doesn't have that required property. So this is where extends comes into play. The extends keyword in TypeScript generics allows us to specify a constraint that that generic type must adhere to. So it's like setting rules or guidelines for what types are permissible by this function. So this ensures that generic functions or classes can only be used with types that meet a set of criteria that we've specified. And that enhances type safety and predictability. So in this example, we're saying that the type T must be any type that has a name property on it because the function uses that name property. 
So one more example then, TypeScript. Suppose we want to create a function that takes an object and a property name, and then it returns the value of the property from the object. So we can use generics along with the extends keyword to ensure that the object actually contains a property specified. In this function, t is a generic type that extends object, meaning that it can be any object, and then k is another generic type that extends key of t. So that's the set of property names in t. So this ensures that the key argument passed into the function is guaranteed to be a key in that object. For example, if we have an object person with properties name and age, we can use the getProperty function to safely retrieve the value of these properties. In this case, calling get property person name returns Alice, which is the name, and get property person age returns 30. But trying to access a property that doesn't exist, like get property person not found, that will result in a TypeScript compilation error. And that's because the extends constraint is ensuring that only keys of that specific object are accepted by that second parameter. So by defining type constraints like this, we can ensure that the generic code we write is not only reusable, but also sticks to the type requirements that we've set up. And that prevents potential runtime errors and type mismatches. Generics aren't just an academic concept or some niche feature of programming languages. They have significant practical applications in everyday programming. And being able to read and understand what generics are doing will make you a better developer. Generics enable you to write flexible and reusable code while maintaining strict type safety. And this is particularly beneficial in large scale applications where maintaining code quality and avoiding type related bugs is really, really important. A real world use for generics is in the develop of utility functions and libraries. So for example, data handling functions that operate on arrays or objects can be made generic to work with any type of data. So this makes our code more modular and it reduces the need for duplicating the code for different data types. Another practical application is in the context of API responses. When interacting with APIs, the response data can vary in structure. So generics allow us to define types for those different responses that can be reused across different API calls. So that ensures that our handling of the response data is type safe and consistent and we can share a lot of code, but different requests come back. So anyway, I hope you found this video useful. As always, please do subscribe to my channel and check out traintocode.com. There's more guides, tutorials, and tips on there to help you along with your web development journey. Until next time, my name's James Joseph, and I'll see you in this video right here.